Despite the current GDP growth of a single digit, Nigerians are still experiencing economic hardship with high cost of living. At the moment, Nigeria seems to be infamous for its retarded growth. When placed side by side with other developing countries, findings revealed that the country as an entity has experienced in good measure and at a very high rate some characteristics that can be likened to those of a struggling state. This include lack of adequate security, corruption, human rights violation, lack of development, weak governance, poor administration, enduring social tensions, violent conflicts, and lack of respect for the rule of law. However, in the midst of rich natural and human resources, Nigeria unfortunately has not measured up with other industrialized societies that came into existence either during or after Nigeria's independence. Joining us on this morning show as we look at the state of the nation is Professor Udenta O. Udenta, founding former National Secretary of the Alliance for Democracy, AD. Good morning, Professor Udenta, and thank you for joining us. Dr. Ruben, it's a pleasure to be with you guys this morning. Well, thank you. Well, quickly, simple question. What's your assessment of the state of the nation? And invariably, by extension, uh, the last 15 months of the uh, Tinubu administration. Very simple question, but very profound. The storm clouds are gathering. And this is not an original saying by me. The project of liberal democracy in Nigeria is under severe and sustained threat. Labor leaders are branded terrorists and accused of terrorism financing, subversion, and treasonable felony. The media is hounded, journalists detained, sometimes disappear at will, and dissent is criminalized and demonized. Courts arbitrarily award judgment to the powers that be to detain protesters who are constitutionally guaranteed to express their angst about the system for 60 days may be renewable. Bank accounts are frozen at will and most absurd, for example, maybe that of Safi Omar in Sokoto State, who is currently detained for insulting the state governor that he couldn't speak good English or is caught F in an exam. This, in a, and this is under the context of pervasive and even exploding hunger, poverty, and discontent. The state of the nation, therefore, is awful. The country today is witnessing an existential crisis of very huge magnitude. The danger for citizens is that we construe democracy to be an event. The military left in 1999. We've now established liberal democracy as a mode of governance. No, democracy is a conversation and a dialogue, and it must be deepened over time. Yes, there are issues with liberal democracy and its normative claims. But still, the forms of that democracy, multi-party democracy, constitutional governance, free press, civil liberties, are formal elements we must guard and protect. But in the past 15 months, we have seen a steady erosion of these democratic values, and it is important that citizens speak out. In my own case, there are two extra claims. As one of those who put together the infrastructure of the democratic government, this world republic, from the front row, who with blood and sweat and tears and multiple detentions crafted, delicately crafted, this construction that has some congenital abnormalities, including the weak constitutional framework. And secondly, for those of us who pride ourselves as public intellectuals, in the mode of Antonio Gramsci and his construct of organic intellectuals that more dismantle hegemonies, or it was said, in Orientalism, pushing back on imperialism, mm -hmm. on Kubala in Nigeria, in his column, on Kubala's column, or Chida Muta, these are beings who must step out to confront the powers that be, because government cannot constrain itself. And the guardrails of democratic governance are clearly under threat. The constitution must constrain the government of the day. And the constitution must prescribe the mode of citizen participation in governance. 
Recently, the Vice President and the Attorney General of the Federation spoke passionately about the willingness of the Bola Tinubu government to permit dissent and press freedom. It is not the duty or the right of the government to permit freedom or civil liberties. The Constitution provides clear guidelines on that. And citizens must push back legitimately, lawfully, and peacefully when those freedoms are breached. So in summation, Dr. Ruben, the state of the nation is what I can describe. A moment of transition, with a transition without a clear direction to human possibilities, and without a clear, clear direction to the transformative ideas of the founding fathers and mothers of this country 60 odd years ago. When we premise this democracy, the idea was to have a build, to start a building blocks of national development and national transformation. But what we're witnessing is almost like state capture. You capture the state, if you look at how democracies die, you capture the state and you transform the state from its liberal moorings into an illiberal authoritarian order. That seems to be what we're witnessing. Finally, democracies no longer die because guns are fired or bullets are released. Occasionally in West Africa you see that, but predominantly democracy is that because those who take power using the laws and processes of democratic governance, weaken those laws, weaken those institutions, abrogate them and subvert them. When you dismantle the guard race of press freedom, the guard race of human liberties, the guidance of free speech and peaceful assembly, you are sowing fear. You are sowing fear. You are creating a chain element that people should back off because the apparatuses of state, really the coercive apparatuses of state are there not to protect the humans in our space, but to protect the government of the day. National security is not state security. It is building human infrastructure in education in health, in housing, in affordable, sustainable living, standard for people. It is not, peri it is not persisting for scarcity. It is not unending poverty and hunger. The moment the situation persists, no amount of pressure on the people, no amount of diminishing you know, civic spaces, no amount of disempowering voices right. will ever stop the people from rising. All right. All right, Professor Odenta, thank you. Now, uh, you'd, you've written, you wrote a lengthy article about you know, two weeks ago, and in there you highlighted in your, in your assessment of the state of, na of the nation three things. Number one, you talked about economic difficulties, widespread hunger, and high levels of poverty. Now, this is despite the interventions of this administration. Um, for instance, we have, we've had the release of grains, we've had certain policies around tariffs um, for food items and essential medical, medical, um, I, uh, medical essentials. What do you think the impact of these policies or these you know, directions have had on what you've termed widespread hunger, high levels of poverty? Any dent? Hardly a dent, and the reasons are pretty obvious for those who care to look at this matter in a rigorous manner. Number one, if you don't get the politics right, you never get the economics right. I'm not a policy wonk. I'm not screwed in issues of microeconomics or macroeconomics or econometrics, no. But I'm very conversant with political economy of power. The Bola Tinubu presidency has abandoned the political state. In 1999, I stressed in that piece, Obasanjo won convincingly, in a way, but elected to build what we can call a lead consensus. He reached out to the other two parties, AD and APP. I was involved, and all together put together some loose government that harmonized the interests of the Nigerian elite as a prefix to building national consensus. He established the Office of Inter-Party Affairs and appointed the chairman of APP, then Senator Mahmoud, was to, to take charge. When the elites see that the government is inclusive and participatory, then the elite will support the government in re-engineering new economic order. But this time in 2023, I'm not tired of repeating it. This President Bola team has virtually no mandate. We have 223 or 230 million Nigerian citizens, or thereabout. 93 million registered with INEC. 
26% of these 93 million participated in the last election. And he garnered 36.7% of the 23% of the 93 million. That is not a mandate. Sorry, Attorney General, the president has got very weak mandate. He needs, therefore, to reach out to the political leaders of this country, those who he defeated in the last presidential election, the leaders of the three, four, five major political parties, civic leaders, leaders of the media world and space and the business community. Together, you can sit down to fashion policies and programs that can impact on the people. Unless you do so, it will not work. How about, Number the, recent, two. How about the recent meeting? So, how about the recent National Council of State meeting? Was that not part of the political I, I, class, political elite, bringing them together? Then he's appointed a PDP man as FCT if, minister as well. If you look at his speech after the end, I mean, after the end of the end hunger and end bad governance protests, that speech lacked three key elements. A convening order, intervention order, and proclamation order. He didn't proclaim anything. He didn't convene nothing. And he didn't prescribe nothing. The Council of State is an important adversary body that the president will have to brief and they will give advice. It's not their duty to pass a vote of confidence in the president or his government. The people will have to do that because of the way they see their life being transformed by his policies. But like I said, those policies will not work because the level of conversation and interface with the political elite is not happening the way you are describing it. The case of FCT is unique in its side because the minister was very clear and unequivocal where he stood in the last election, who he was going to support, and the benefit that will accrue to him. So when you talk about the elite consensus, you reach the leadership of the parties who will yield those members to you so that by the time you have them in, it will not be disruptive. They will not even see you as damaging the credibility and sovereignty and autonomy of those parties. Most crucial, if you go into the area of, of the policies you talked about, if you did not even have full subsidy removal in your speech. And they just announced it in a cavalier manner. Yes, yeah, that is audacious. That is an act of courage. You can say, you are trading with in angels feared to trade in the past. But what did you have in place? Because the moment you take that squeeze out of the people's breath, every other thing will fall down. The market they go to. The garage they buy, the rides they buy, the bins they buy, the clothes the children wear, the school fees, the transportation costs, everything will skyrocket. What did you have in plan for the short term, mid term, and long term? And on top of it, you collapsed the multiple windows of the forex market and narrowed it that today Naira has lost 70% of its value since that policy was enunciated and 43% in the past okay. 12 okay. months. Okay. So with runaway inflation, you can contain. Okay. Okay, Prof, I mean, you've uh, painted the dilemma as we speak. And let's posit a couple of possible solutions and scenarios. Do you think what the patriots are talking about now of a full restructuring is the way to go? We've heard some voices from the north and don't see the fact that they are not down for a restructuring. But we've also heard voices in the south saying that that's the way forward. Because all of this, really, the reason why politicians play their game is because of the resource. It's not because they are passionate about the country. It's because of access to the resource of this country for their own benefits, not really about the benefits of the people. So it's a fight for the resource. Do you think the idea should be to push the resource closer to the people? Yes, President Tinubu, you said he has not done anything. But he says he has started the process with this local government autonomy. Do you think we should have a full restructuring okay, okay. as the patriots are pushing for? Okay I, 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 okay, I get it. And I'm actually in a very, you know, refined, a very difficult situation here. I belong to that patriot club. We've earned the right to become patriots of this country, not just patriots by mouth or name, but indeed. But then, there is a difference between objective intention and actualized intent in literary discourses of philosophical discussions too. What intent and what you expect may not be the outcome you, you get ultimately. In 1998, there was an opening, a glaring opening, 
to reorder Nigeria to restructure it. When Abacha died and Abiola ultimately died, without realizing his mandate, if he had realized his mandate, there would have been a closure because that new constitution would have been proclaimed with him as a president to form a cabinet and then government at the subnational levels. But he died, and Abdullah Mebo Baka took over on behalf of the military. And there was a constitutional document that was being paraded. Our Secretary of Alliance for Democrats and ultimately Secretary of the Joint Committee of the two parties, AD and APP, we saw that document. We didn't really bother to go through it. Let me be honest and confess, as many have confessed before me, we wanted the military to get out. And they got out, and a new president was sworn in, new governors, et cetera, et cetera. When that happened, there's a closure. When you close up the constitution, and they then go to the president somewhere down the line and say, I want you to amend this constitution, take away the constitution, bring a new one. Therefore, you bring in a conference with constituent powers, what they call a sovereign national conference, which you can invoke through referendum. The president is incapable of doing it. Abbas Ajo couldn't do it in 2005 or 6. Jonathan couldn't achieve it in 2014. This president will not even achieve it. Because it's plain and plain sight that what the patriots, our group, is asking, but it's my personal opinion, not the group opinion of the group, is to restructure the country on the basis of a new constitutional order. To get that constitutional order implemented, you must dismantle the existing constitution, and to dismantle the most existing, you must dismantle the parliament. The parliament must commit class suicide for you to have a new constitution, because you must insert in this, in this existing constitution, 1999 has amended a proviso that will take away the powers of the parliament to amend the constitution. It was in a referendum which cannot be controlled by the parliament. I'm not going to prescribe in public whether the parliament will do it. If you go to the president as they've gone to the president and bring a beautiful document, if it doesn't lobby the National Assembly and constitute powers within, this, within the national you know, geographic space, the national union, the ethnic association, the interfaith groups and so on, it will be a non-starter because the parliament can use that document as a toilet paper. And that's nothing anybody can do. There are three ways you can bring a new constitution on board. And one, I usually do not discuss in public. But please, ask your viewers and readers and listeners later down the line to go and study Fujimoro of Peru in 1992, what he did. I will not prescribe it in public. That's the only way to dismantle an existing democratic constitution and recompose it somewhere down the line. The second is for you to do what overwhelm the state and flush out the powers that be a great vacuum, which is, of course, going against the democratic order in order to create a space to do it. The third, as I said, is a painful process of lobbying, of negotiation of differences, of where histories collide and entities will battle for attention and who is going to have what. As you correctly pointed out, this. The center, yes. Professor Denta. Yeah, I was just going to say, look, yeah. don't, let, don't let us go to Peru. Let us stay here in Nigeria. And I would like to take you back to okay. Alliance for Democracy. You started with that uh, uh, movement, uh, 1998, I think, I recall. I did. I did. Yeah, you were founding uh, yes, National Secretary. Now, the people that are in, gov in government today, they are your people. Uh, President Tinubu, uh, you know, came into politics on the platform of uh, Alliance for Democracy. Chief Bisi Akonde uh, was there. There were, you know, many others. Do you think that the uh, ideology of uh, progressive uh, politics, I think that's the phrase that was used, do you think it has been be betrayed? Are you disappointed with uh, President Tinubu? Now, Dr. Ruben, you and I read literature extensively and you study Animal Farm, the revolution and the revolution betrayed. AD was like a revolution, a revolutionary eruption of a type, a part of a new type in Nigeria and other point in our history. It was ultimately betrayed. Today, that betrayal is in full flight. AD is not APC. APC is a contraption, a loose contraption of, of inquiry ideas and interests that simply came together for the moment of power. AD was something delicate, put together with civil society intent, that passion to transform Nigeria. They're not the same. And individuals in them have transformed. So, Bola Tinubu, you know, our governor in 1999, is not Bola as a president in 2023. He's passed through physics, the transformation from AD to AC, to ACN, to APC with the contamination that occurred in that regard. Not only the contamination of the body of politics and body of interest, but the contamination of the human. 
Because if you become increasingly more powerful and more powerful down the line, let me give you an example. Arab Moy was chosen by Jomo Kenyatta as a president. Arab Moy ran in quote a democratic government, but he handed in Gugi Wachongo to exile. So he banished many people. Even Pobia is democratic in a way. So civilian dictatorship is not something new. AD wasn't in that mood. APC is in that mood. So maybe, maybe the agencies you are describing Robert Tinubu, you know, you know, Elbisa Conde, and the rest of them may have been contaminated by the agency they elected to use for power. And it was a different agency. This is a new, new, new kind of agency. Remember who was there in 2015? That's Mohamed Buhari. For eight years, he holed up in the villa. We saw some pictures of picking his teeth, as if he didn't care. And then the leader of the party then was the same Robert Tinubu, our current president. He said virtually nothing. So when we hear that the economy is bad, the economy is in a dire strait. That dire strait did not start today or 15 months ago. The acceleration and intensification and heightening of natural contradiction occurred under the watch of, 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 of Mohamed Buhari. With Bola Tinubu as the leader of the party then. That means it is no longer that project of redemption that AD cast in 1998 that is still playing today. It is now a new kind of politics of power and politics of dominance and politics of hegemony. That brings us again to the question that citizens, those of us who were part of that old AD, who were part of that class that worked for democratic triumph in Nigeria, will not keep still. Rather, we are going to quietly begin the process of intergenerational mobilization. I want to put it out there in public. Intergenerational mobilization. Identifying across the spaces of Nigeria, proud patriots and Democrats who still care for this country, who are watching the project of liberal democracy with all its sham, normative claims being toppled overnight before our eyes, where the media is frightened to talk, where the world leaders are being hounded as terrorists, where the economy itself has tanked dangerously and no effort is being made to reach out to a broad you know, spectrum of the public for consensus building. Because if you don't reach out to the people who you don't even like, if you don't engage the political class in difficult questions of governance, it's unfortunate. They will run down the clock. I'm not going to play politics on this stage now. But let me explain what I mean by running on the clock. In 2026 May, thereabout, the new candidates for the next election will be known. Unlike before, when that will be determined by December 2026, three months to the next election. It will happen now virtually a year before the next election. That means the volatile presidency has only till the end of 2025 to govern properly. Because by 2025 ending, the aspirants will start emerging from the various parties campaigning across the country for two, three, four months before the primaries. So what you have to do now is to re-engage the political state and re-establish the political order. For the civic side, it is not going to create a, dis, you know, you know, a, a disjoint or a disconnect between the state and the civil society. Civil society is a very potent element for national transformation and social development. Gerard Dua created the Office of Special Advice on, on Civil Society Relations. He can reanimate that office and engage the broad spectrum of civic voices to help you govern well. So I hear you, sir, with regards to um, political class, sorting that out, political elite, even before you even look at the economy. I don't, a number of people might argue with you on that. But let's take a look at the current political class. What many might say is that a lot of people in politics today are there based on their own interests. And you're asking for a conclave, a meeting of people coming together to rub minds and, you know, find solutions to the challenges that we have currently. Would that be effective, bearing in mind the people who make up the political class today? Okay, I get it too. In the First Republic, there was a political class was defined by human beings the likes of Obafemi Awolo, Nam Jazikiwe, Tafawa Belewa, you know, Madu Belo, you know, and the, and the rest of them who cared deeply about this country, who are imperfect like every mortal was imperfect. But the project of dismantling colonial modernity with his, you know, you know, his enlightenment spirit in order to create a space for African renaissance and African freedom and sovereignty was very deep in their heart. And for the First Republic, they did the best they could. Don't forget that that republic was toppled by the military because it was imperfect, grossly institutionally and structurally imperfect. But today we hunger for it, which means in spite of the failure of that first republic, it is far better than what we have today. Second republic, the same. These guys, both men and women, we are Nigerians. They are not foreigners. 
The current political players are still Nigerians. But the way Amana the politics is played is dependent on the engine of playing that politics. That engine is what empowers the agency, the human agency, to behave the way they behave. The constitution is very important. I agree. It's amendment. We you talked about reducing the potency of the presidency in that restructuring you know, in, in the movement. That means if you make the center relatively unattractive and make the subnational units very attractive, then it means that people will be less inclined to become president who controls, in real sense, over 70% of national resources, not the 55% you find revenue mobilization ascribed to it. Control 99% of the coercive arm of the state in terms of the trajectory of violence. The military, the police, the defense, the everything, the DSS and NIA, etc., etc., the paramilitary units. So people must kill and die at the level of contestation for power the presidency. Okay. That is what has now corrupted the political class. Okay. okay, Prof, but I disagree with you. And I'll tell you how. We have seen the nefarious okay. activities of the states. I were just seated here talking about state governors building airports they do not need. We have also seen the case of the resource control that a lot of people fought for in the late, early, late 90s to the early 2000s. When it was finally given, it wasn't a veritable tool for development of the Niger Delta. The advocacy for NDDC after OBPADEC has not become a veritable tool for development of the Niger Delta. Is it these same scoundrels that only think about themselves and how to fleece the resource of the state you are going to devolve more power and resource to so that they continue the balkanization of the economic prospects of the country? Okay. Okay, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying at the level of rhetoric. But at the level of practice, we are saying the same thing. Your voice out there is very powerful and loud, and Nigerians appreciate that voice from this platform. The media is key to interrogating the behavior of the political class, to holding their feet to fire, on fire, and then seeking answers to questions that are very difficult questions they pose. The second is mass mobilization, the third is civic groups. If you have multiple empowered civic spaces that we talk, we don't have that in Nigeria. It is just well, enough, in good enough number the at the local space, level. The civic space has become a geon geon civic space. It's all about geon geon, what is in it for me? You can see recently, any okay. time the, 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 you see civil society group going to defend all sorts of nefarious politicians, it's become a state for chop chop. So the civic space is gradually dying, except for few ones. Okay, okay. Now civic space is not is not dying. On the first of August, to the tenth of August, or maybe slightly before the tenth of August, there was even dissented spaces of simple of civic voices across the country. There was no physical meeting. I didn't see any assemblies. I didn't see any gathering like you have even bring back the gears at the fountain here. But through the instrumentality of more of new media, through the dictatorized media spaces, hundreds of thousands, even millions, were mobilized across the country, not on a contingent basis, not even an ephemeral basis, to say, end hunger, end bad governance. Rufai, it was not me that did it. It wasn't even you. The voices are out there, and I cannot diminish them on this platform, that why there are elements in society, in every sector, in the judiciary, in the political class, in the military, in the police, in the civic space, okay, that professor. have been corrupted to sustain this unequitable condition. You find those spaces still very powerful and loud. That's yeah. why they were able to mobilize. You can't talk about accounts being frozen, professor. people being detained, court orders being cut in, if those professor spaces are Denta. not important and prominent. They are. Well, Professor Denta, well, the Tinubu administration will probably say that the civic space is hyperactive after the recent uh, hashtag end bad governance uh, protests and the threat that there will be more yes. protests uh, in October. Uh, but there are other issues you can raise about the integrity of some of the participants in uh, the civic space. Thank you very much for joining us.